Hey, this is Barry O'Dell in the After the Stream group. This uh, private group on Facebook is affiliated, connected to the uh, Church of Christ at Mammoth Spring public Facebook page. So I go live there Monday through Thursday at 11 o'clock. And then as I'm going live, sometimes I get questions or comments or maybe a thought enters my mind where I think, hey, I'm going to do something. I'm going to do another video about this. So today is one of those days. And we are going to talk about works. Um, you can see I've got a PowerPoint that I'm going to use today. I've not been doing that lately, but we're going to do it today. Um, this video will be uploaded to YouTube later. But uh, it's in this private group in Facebook. If you have any questions or comments, use the comment section. So here's what I want us to talk about. Let's talk about the Bible and works. And so where this idea comes from or where this subject matter comes from is actually, again, from today's live stream. We looked at the rich young ruler, Matthew chapter 19, and we're going to talk about some things here. But let's talk about the word works first. It's always important to define our terms as we are studying the Bible. What do we mean? Well, the Greek term used in the New Testament is ergon, and it means work, as you see here, performance, labor, business, etc., etc., uh, Strong's number 2041, if you have a uh, Greek lexicon or a, a Greek word study book, you can look that up and see what we're talking about here. Let's talk about works in the Bible. Now, like I said, this, is, this study today is based on looking at the rich young ruler. And the reason for doing it this way, for me, is because of these three verses. Matthew, Mark, and Luke all record Jesus' interaction with the rich young ruler. He comes to Jesus with a question, and uh, Matthew records it like this, What good thing shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? Mark and Luke say, What shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? But you'll notice each of those three verses, the young man understood he needed to do something. Okay? What shall I do? What good thing shall I do? So, obviously, he... <laughs> In, in At least in his mind, he understood, hey, there's something I must do to inherit eternal life. Now, I want to say this too. I'll pop this up on the screen. It is commonly taught today, a couple different angles, I guess you would say, about works and salvation. And this, this will come out more clearly as we go through this particular study. Number one, it's taught that you cannot do anything to be saved. Okay? If you're going to be saved... God's going to do it for you. Or it's taught that you cannot do anything until God grants you the ability to be saved. Uh, this falls in the um, falls under the category or falls under the heading of Calvinism. Um, total depravity. You know, hey, if you're lost in sin, if you're dead in sin, like Ephesians 2 and verse 1 says, a dead man can't do anything. So God has to grant you the power to do this. You are one of God's chosen, and so He will give you the ability. So this is how this is taught. And again, as we progress through this video, you'll see what I'm talking about, and uh, we'll make an application of it. So let's talk about different works here that are mentioned in the Bible. Number one, good works, obviously, mentioned in the Bible. So over, for instance, here, first verse I've got, Matthew chapter 5 and verse 16, Jesus speaking, "...let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works." and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Acts 9 and verse 36, this is the uh, the funeral, if you will, of Tabitha, also known as Dorcas, and it talks about the many good works that she had done. And then Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10, we are created in Christ for good works. So that's, that is a type of work that is mentioned in Scripture. And you will notice that each of those types of work, and, and by the way, this is not a listing of every time the word works or work is used in the New Testament, uh, but just examples of each. But each of those, Matthew, Acts, and Ephesians, are talking about people who are following Christ. They're going to do good works. They're going to do good things, all right? We've got works of God. Now, this is an interesting passage here in John chapter 6, because Jesus is being followed by a multitude of people, all right? He has just fed the 5,000, and this is kind of a follow-up to him having fed the 5,000, and these, so you read, we're not going to read all of this, but you read John 6, verses 22 down through verse 28, and you will see that this is a large crowd of people following him and asking him questions. And uh, here's the question they ask. John 6, verse 28, what shall we do 
that we may work the works of God. So there's a very specific question asked by a multitude of people. And his response is, This is the work of God that you believe in Him whom He sent. Obviously referring to Himself. So it is a work of God. Now that doesn't mean that God does it for you. He places upon those individuals the responsibility to believe in Him as the Son of God. Um, that discussion is also had in John chapter 5. Uh, if you start reading in John 5, about verse 31, he talks about the different things that bear witness to the fact that he is the Son of God. So there are good works, there are works of God, there are works of repentance, according to the Bible. Let me turn over here real quick, Acts chapter 26. Uh, this is when Paul is before King Agrippa. I'll just start reading in verse 19. Therefore, King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision, but declared first to those in Damascus and in Jerusalem, and throughout all the region of Judea, and then to the Gentiles, that they should repent, turn to God, and do works befitting repentance. Notice that progression there. He preached to them, Gentiles, repent, turn to God, do works befitting of repentance. That's, you know, that's very similar to what John the uh, baptizer was preaching. Uh, bring forth fruits worthy of repentance. Matthew chapter 3, what was that, verse 7 or 8? Anyway, there are works of repentance. It, 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 in other words, your repentance is evident. You prove it by the things that you are doing that you have indeed repented, uh, which is a personal responsibility of each person if they want to be saved. You have works of darkness or works of the flesh. Um, of course, works of the flesh, Galatians 5, verses 19 through 21. I would say we're familiar with that. Uh, Romans chapter 13 and verse 12 says... Uh, the night is far spent, the day is at hand, therefore let us cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. There's another character, another uh, category of works. Here's a big one. Works of the law. Now this is, uh, there are several passages we could look at here. I'm going to go to Romans 9. That's the first one listed here. This is where a lot of people in religion get, religion, in um in the Christian world, and what I mean by saying the Christian world is those who believe there is a God and those who believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and that the Bible is the Word of God. Now, under that umbrella of a definition, there are a lot of different categories, all right? There are a lot of different belief systems. But a lot of people, when we're talking about works and salvation and obedience, they get hung up on this quote-unquote, works of the law and what we are talking about. So we're going to look at all three of these verses and uh, come to an understanding of it. Uh, Romans 9, I'm going to start, it's mentioned in verse 32, but I'm going to start in verse 30. What shall we say then? That Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have attained to righteousness, even the righteousness of faith? But Israel pursuing the law of righteousness has not attained to the law of righteousness. Why? Because they did not seek it by faith, but as it were by the works of the law. That tells you what this phrase, the works of the law, means. The Jews sought to be righteous by the works of the law. Now, what law did the Jewish people follow? The law of Moses, the Ten Commandments. There's no question about that. They sought righteousness by the works of the law. Um, why did they do that? Well, verse 30, the end of verse 32, it says, For they stumbled at the stumbling stone. The, here's the thing. The Jewish people, you know, they, they had the law of Moses for 1,500 years, all right, from uh, recorded there in uh, Exodus chapters 19 and 20 when they um, arrived at Mount Sinai. They got the commandments delivered to Moses by God on the mountain. From that point until the death of Christ for 1,500 years, the Jewish people followed this law. And when Jesus came on the scene, as it says here, they stumbled at the stumbling stone. And of course, that's a reference to Jesus. They were more concerned with the works, with, with keeping the works of the law, the law of Moses, than they were with being obedient to Christ. And here's the thing, their law even talked about him. You go back to Deuteronomy chapter 18, and Moses told the Israelites, listen, there's going to be a prophet that comes from among you like unto me. You need to listen to him and everything he says. All right, Galatians chapter 2 and verse 16. Now, this is <clears throat> this particular verse is in the context of Peter 
of, of Paul having confronted Peter because Peter was acting like a hypocrite. He would eat with Gentiles when it was just Gentiles, but when any Jewish people would come around, he'd go away from the Jews. And Paul says he was being a hypocrite, and he was not walking according to the truth of the gospel. Galatians 2 and verse 14. Uh, verse 16, he says, "...knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ." He's contrasting the works of the law of Moses as opposed to having faith in Christ and following the faith of Christ that he talks about in Galatians chapter 3. No man is justified by the works of the law, um, uh, but by faith in uh, Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Christ Jesus that we might be justified by faith and not by the works of the law, for by the works of the law no flesh shall be justified. I mean, it says it three times in that one verse, talking about the works of the law. You cannot be saved by the law of Moses. It's not, it's not possible uh, in the New Covenant. Now, you go to Galatians 3 and verse 10. Paul writes, For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not continue in all the things which are written in the book of the law to do them. And Paul actually quotes Deuteronomy 27 and verse 26 right there. And then he says, But that no flesh... Or rather, but that no one is justified by the law in the sight of God is evident, for the just shall live by faith. So when we read about the works of the law in the New Testament, passages like Romans 9, Galatians 2, Galatians 3, we're, we're not reading about God saying, oh, there's nothing you can do to be saved. That's, that's obviously not true. We're talking about the law of Moses. You cannot be justified by the works of that law. It's not possible. We need to understand what that means. Next, we read about works of righteousness. So we're going to go over to Titus chapter 3. And I know I have verse 5 there. Um, Titus, well, the whole book of Titus is a very fundamental, very basics of Christianity type of document. And uh, in, in Titus chapter 2, he talks about the behavior of old men towards younger men, older women towards younger women, and how older Christians can you know, do a lot to bring up good, strong, faithful, young men and women within Christ. That's what all of Galat uh, Titus chapter 2 is about. And um, in fact, Titus 2.15 says, Speak these things, exhort and rebuke with all authority, let no one despise you, remind them. The them is the people of chapter 2. Old Christian men and women, young Christian men and women, Remind them to be subject to rulers and authorities, to obey, to be ready for every good work, to speak evil of no one, to be peaceable, gentle, showing all humility to all men. And then he starts in on this thought. For we ourselves were also once foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving various lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. But, okay, so here's a contrast. This is how we were, but when the kindness and the love of God our Savior appeared toward man, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy He saved us. Now notice what He's talking, because a lot of people will take Titus 3 and verse 5 and say, see it says, not by works of righteousness which we have done, therefore you cannot do anything to be saved. God has to choose you, God has to select you. That's not what Paul's saying here. He's telling Christians how to conduct themselves. He said, because we used to live foolishly, but then God's kindness and love appeared toward man, not by works of righteousness which we have done. What he's saying there is God didn't send his son. God, in fact, didn't send, looking back at verse 4, his love and kindness because of works of righteousness which we have done. We didn't deserve what God did for us. That's what Titus 3 and verse 5 is saying. Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy He saved us. And then he mentions two aspects of that. Through the washing of regeneration. That word wash there means bath, a bathing. The washing of re regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit. Man, that's a, that's a dead ringer with uh, John chapter 3, verses 3 through 5, being born of water in the Spirit. Um, Romans chapter 6 and verse 4, being buried in baptism and raised to walk in newness of life. The washing of regeneration is baptism, and the renewal of the Holy Spirit is being renewed by the Spirit, raised up to walk in newness of life, putting to death the deeds of the old man and living by the, uh, the new man, 
Romans chapter 6. So you have works of righteousness. God didn't send His Son here because we earned it, what He's saying. Then finally, we have works of faith, all right? James 2. We're not going to read all these verses, verses 14 through 16, about um, uh, faith with works as opposed to faith without works. I'll just read the first couple of verses here. James 2, 14, beginning, What does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that type of faith save him? The answer to that question is no. Now, I understand James, the book of James, is written to Christians. So this this section here is not talking about uh, non-Christians and what they must do to be saved. It's talking to Christians who need to keep on doing what's right, who need to have a faith that is evident by the works that they do. You know, that goes back up to the first point here, Matthew 5, 16, uh, Ephesians 2 and verse 10. There's, there's a connection there. If we're God's people, we're going to do works that are evident of that fact. Um, James 2 and verse 26. For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. It's not possible to be a child of God and not do anything and not have works of faith. All right? So so what? I, I like to ask that question when I'm studying for myself or preparing for a lesson or whatever. So let's ask a so what. Well, let's talk about baptism. Because this is where the churches of Christ are often attacked. Will you guys stress work salvation? You guys believe that you have to do something in order to be saved. And, and baptism is, you know, you, you stress baptism and you take away from the grace of God, you take away from the mercy of God. There are a lot of straw man arguments that are built saying that the churches of Christ believe in earning their salvation or the works salvation. There is one verse that deals with this, with that thought forever that we believe in a works salvation, and that verse is right here, Colossians 2 and verse 12. Paul writes there, Buried with him in baptism, in which you also were raised with him through faith in the working of God, who raised him from the dead. Now look at that verse. It's talking about baptism, about being buried, raised up. Who works in baptism? Through faith in the working of God. I like the King James Version here. It says, through faith in the operation of God. God works. God operates in baptism. That word there for working is energia, energy. That means something, something or someone is at work. Someone or something is operative or active or efficient. It talks about efficiency in the definition. It's not me working to earn my salvation in baptism. God has commanded it. Jesus commanded baptism. Um, you, if you, don't, you know, Matthew 28, 19, Mark 16, verse 16. Uh, then you look at the teachings of the apostles all throughout the book of Acts, uh, throughout the letters. <clears throat> Just a few verses I'll reference. Acts 2, 38. Um, Acts 22, 16. Romans 6, verses 3 and 4, 1 Corinthians 12, 13, Galatians 3, 27, 1 Peter 3, 21. I mean, the, the, the list goes on and on. But the claim oftentimes, uh, or the attack, if you will, against churches of Christ is, well, you guys teach you have to do something in order to be saved. I, you know, the, here's the thing. There's a fundamental misunderstanding here. The church of Christ doesn't have a formulated doctrine that it follows. In fact, I was talking to somebody the other day. I ran into him at Walmart, a fellow I've talked to in the past about um, religious questions and things like this. Uh, and, and he's one that, you know, we have a, a good relationship with each other. He's not a member of the Church of Christ. <clears throat> but uh, we're friendly and all this. But he, among others, believe that this is something that, you know, we're striving for our own salvation. We're trying to work our way into heaven. That is a misrepresentation. It's a misunderstanding. Perhaps that's a good way to put it. When I tell a person, listen, if you want to be saved, you can be, but you need to be baptized for the remission of your sins. That's not me telling them that person that. I will show them, hey, here, look, here's what this verse says. Here's what this verse says, etc., etc. And when we understand Colossians 2 and verse 12, 
use my cursor here, we are raised with him through faith in the working of God, the operation of God. When a person submits to the will of God that states he must be baptized in order to have the remission of sins, he is not working for his salvation. He's doing what God told him to do in order to be saved. You know, I think of Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 9. <clears throat> that verse tells us that Jesus is the author of eternal salvation unto all those who obey him. We have a choice in the matter. Uh, an another good verse to think about that, about having a choice, where Jesus kind of paints this very clear picture. <clears throat> He's talking to an audience here. Let's see. John 5 verse 39, he says, You search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. And these are they which testify of me. But you are not willing to come to me that you may have life. I have a will. Every one of us has a will. And we can say, yeah, I'm going to follow God, or no, I'm not going to. That choice is in my hands. And if I say, yes, I'm going to follow him, then I'm going to be willing to submit to his will in terms of baptism. So again, this all goes back to the rich young ruler. Now, the rich young ruler was under the law of Moses. Baptism was not a part of the law of Moses. It didn't come on the scene until you have John the baptizer preaching at baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. Mark chapter 1 and verse 4, Jesus, the apostles, the 70 disciples preaching that same message there in the first century. And then, of course, you see it uh, on uh, Pentecost in Acts chapter 2 and then throughout the books, I mean, extensively throughout the book of Acts. It wasn't people trying to earn their salvation. Baptism is not about me trying to work my way into heaven. It's about doing what God requires, period. You know, when you think of these other things, <clears throat> you know, everybody would agree that if you need to, uh, if you want to please God and go to heaven, you need to believe in Jesus. Yeah. You get, you probably get 100% agreement on that. And, and uh, repentance, you need to repent of your sins. Yeah. 100% agreement. Nobody would say, no, you can keep on sinning, God will save you. Why is it then that when we get to baptism, which is actually mentioned more times in the New Testament than repentance, that there is so much disagreement about this subject and so much misunderstanding? I mean, from the Gospels to Acts to the letters, baptism is mentioned over and over again. Uh, the purpose of baptism, you know, what it, what it accomplishes, what happens when a person submits to God's will and is buried in baptism, as Colossians 2 and verse 12 here says, and raised to walk in newness of life, as Romans chapter 6 and verse 4 points out. It's not about me trying to work my way into heaven. It's not about me trying to earn my way there. You can't. Nobody can do that. But we can all obey God and, and obey His will and uh, have faith in the operation of God. When I do what He commands, He will do what He has promised. I love looking at Mark 16, 16 this way. <clears throat> so Mark 16, 16 is often cited. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be condemned. Have you ever taken the time to consider that that is not a command? That's a promise. The one who believes and who has been baptized, those are Greek particles, uh, I'm sorry, uh, participles. They are um, kind of like a verbal noun. The one who believes and the one who has been baptized shall be saved. That is a promise. It's not a command. Now, there are other passages uh, throughout the New Testament where baptism is a command. This is a promise. Um, well, if I want to be saved, and God's made me a promise as to how that can happen, then I'm going to do what he, uh, what he requires of me. Baptism in water for the remission of sins is not about works salvation. In fact, it's quite the opposite. I trust God that He will do what He has promised to do. And that is, He will wash me. He will save me. He will add me to His church. Okay, Acts 2 verses 41 through 47. You can read about that there. Well... That's that. I've got a few viewers on here. Now, I know this is a private group. It's quite a bit smaller than what I do on my daily live stream. But if you have any questions or comments after this live stream is over, use the comment section here. Send me a private message, whatever. But uh, that's it. You can't work your way into heaven. You can't make God owe you anything. 
In fact, we are indebted to him to do his will. All right, guys. I guess that's all I've got. Appreciate you being here. And uh, I will see you on the next video.